Good morning and welcome to the virtual YouTube worship service for Kearsarge Community Presbyterian Church here in New London, New Hampshire. We're delighted that you can join us in this way as we continue to do our best to prevent the spread of infection. Please continue to keep Doris Huntley in your prayers. She is in recovery from surgery and is receiving rehab at New London Hospital. Also, please remember our former director of music, Eleanor Allman, and her children. Eleanor is in hospice care at this time. This past week, our elders met for their monthly meeting during which we discussed when KCPC might be able to reopen. While a final decision has not yet been made, we are hopeful that if the vaccination rate has reached about 60% and the infection rates are extremely low by the middle of June, we can open with restricted worship in July. If the vaccination and infection rates remain favorable through the summer, we might be able to more fully open with fewer restrictions after Labor Day. Thank you for your patience and for your understanding as we make these difficult and challenging decisions. Remember, the shopping cart for your donations to area food pantries is available every Sunday from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. outside the Narthex entrance. Thank you for your support in alleviating the hunger of your neighbors during this challenging time. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Hear the word of the psalmist who wrote, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. Our hosannas are muted, our shouts of triumph less than excited, all glorious and everlasting Lord. Yet, yes, you have brought us to another Palm Sunday, but we lament how we cannot gather to wave our palms and sing to the wonder of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We remain sad and disheartened as we miss the gleam in our children's eyes and their joy as palms are distributed among us. Even in our absence from one another, fill us with the excitement and joy in knowing how your son Jesus brought salvation and forgiveness to all people on that amazing day in ancient Jerusalem and hear us as we pray the way Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Far too often, we blame others for our own personal sins. We become angry and upset at someone else when we ourselves have committed the same sin. May we be honest with the Lord as we face our own sin. Let us pray. O merciful and forgiving God, we remember when Jesus entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed Messiah and King by those who spread garments and branches along his way. As we celebrate this Palm Sunday apart from one another, may we name our own sins of failing to reach out in charity and grace to each other in our struggles through this pandemic. We recognize how we've made our own assumptions. We've second-guessed the decisions of our leaders, and we've selfishly failed to consider the fears and the worries of our fellow disciples. Forgive us, dear Lord, of these sins as we stumble along the way to follow Jesus to the cross of his crucifixion that we may each die and rise again with him and enter into your kingdom through his wondrous and forgiving name. And hear us now in the silence of this day as we bring to you our individual confessions. Amen. The psalmist assured us that out of my distress, I called on the Lord and the Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. With the Lord at my side, I do not fear. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Grant us salvation, for you, O Lord, have become our strength and our might. You have become our salvation. In Christ Jesus' name, our sins are forever forgiven. Let us give thanks to the Lord for his gracious mercy this day and forevermore. Amen.
Our lesson today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. When they, Jesus and his disciples, were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it and will send it back immediately. The disciples went away, and they found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They told him what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then the disciples brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and Jesus sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday is the pinnacle of Jesus' pre-crucifixion ministry. It marks for the first time a near universal recognition he is more than a gifted preacher a, and miracle worker. The crowds who shout Hosanna recognize this and they even call Jesus King of Israel. The Jewish religious leaders watching from the city walls realize this rise of his popularity, and in the process, they see their own authority beginning to evaporate. The Roman officials who guard the gates and control most aspects of civil governance understand that their well-tuned system could experience a major shakeup. For all who witness this spectacle, whether they supported Jesus or reject him, they can see Jesus has arrived and the religious and possibly the civil order is changing and changing fast. Change and moving ahead is the backdrop of the first Palm Sunday march into Jerusalem. Jesus, the itinerant rabbi from backwater Galilee, has arrived to change the dominating godly covenant order for the people in Judea and Galilee. For approximately 2,000 years, they lived under the covenant of the law, handed down from Moses during their exodus and escape from Egypt. The Lord had given the law directly to Moses, who in turn handed, over, handed it over to the people, specifically the tribe of Levi, who would evolve into the priestly class and become the keepers of the law. Through the course of Jewish history, through kings good and bad, through invasion and through exile, through commerce and migration, the law dominated, regulated, and controlled, and some would even say, even enslaved the children of Israel. Enslavement is never good. Whether we are talking about one human owning another, or some external force such as debt, 
or racism or sexism or class distinctions, all of these are bad and be, can be considered enslavement. When some person or group or system forcibly controls another individual or group in some unwanted way, we have enslavement. The possibility might exist to voluntarily remove oneself from the enslaving system, but often to do so risk encountering negative and challenging consequences. In many respects, this is what has occurred among the Jewish citizens in ancient Judea and Galilee at the time of Jesus. They basically had three choices for practicing their faith within the context of their culture. Two were acceptable, a third was not. First, there was the option to uh, associate with the priestly class, which included the temple priest or the tribe of Levi, the scribes and the Sadducees, and the royalty. In a nutshell, this group focused on maintaining and abiding by the practice of temple worship in Jerusalem. This included hosting pilgrimages, sacrifices, temple taxes, and the observance of special Jewish holy days. It could also be noted that the priestly class and those who associated with it cooperated closely with the Roman civil authorities. The second option revolved around the teachings and the practices of the Pharisees. This group had emerged about five centuries prior to Christ while the educated and business class Jews were in exile in the foreign lands of Assyria and Babylon. Their motivation to emerge as a viable part of Judaism, well, it was good and it was noble. In order to maintain their faith and their identity as distinct from the people and culture where they lived as aliens, the Pharisees earnestly studied, practiced, and lived by the law found in the first five books of the Bible. The Pharisees basically wanted to teach and live the Jewish faith, and they used the law to guide these endeavors. Their lives centered in on local synagogues, where faith could be taught and learned and corrected and practiced when not done so exactly. The Pharisees, for the most part, despised the Romans, and they only associated with them when they thought it might benefit. The third option in Jesus' time included everyone else outside of those first two options or systems. The challenge these people experienced was that they were considered unclean and even corrupt. They were thought of as being devoid of God completely. And because of this, the other two groups shunned and avoided this third group. The priests and the Pharisees would refer to this third group as the sinners. Jesus and his disciples, his followers, and those who were keenly interested in what he was teaching, they were all lumped into this category. And in the eyes of the religious elite, Jesus and his band of followers were sinners. And we see this in the Gospels over and over again. This is the Palm Sunday backdrop that is crucially important for us each to know and to understand. Jesus is an outsider, disrupting the ordered and socially acceptable norms of those in power. He and his group are negatively labeled with terms such as sinner, blasphemer, false teacher, sorcerer, and other false accusations. So when the priest and some of the Pharisees went to the Roman governor in charge 
and accused Jesus and his group with insurrection, treason, and the desire to overthrow Caesar, well, the Romans had no choice but to act. The triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem was the final piece of evidence Rome needed. The palm waving, the shouting, the public adoration was never deserved by an itinerant preacher and healer. Such a public spectacle and parade was reserved exclusively for mighty Caesar and victorious generals. The governor from Rome could not let such an inappropriate spectacle go unpunished. Yet for this wider group of sinners who were shunned and ignored by the priest and the Pharisees, Jesus and his message of a new covenant forged and built out of godly grace, forgiveness, and mercy resonated with their hearts and with their minds. Here was someone who took the law and began stripping away all the baggage, the complications, and the burdens which had been artificially attached during the previous 2,000 years. Jesus homed in on the original covenant of the Ten Commandments, and then he unwrapped and removed the impossibly pejorative regulations and punishments associated with the core of the law. And in the process, replaced harsh discipline with loving forgiveness. Do you see the difference? Originally, breaking the law deserved punishment because a faithful person never wanted to break the law nuance after nuance was added to the original intent. Subsequently, hundreds of layers surrounding an original command, such as you shall not covet your neighbor's belongings, became impossible to fully obey. Jesus stripped away all these added layers and would say instead, love your neighbor as yourself. And if you see anything that your neighbor possesses that you want but cannot have, ask God to forgive you of this wrong desire. And the Lord will. The Lord's grace will fill you with peace which will lift the desire from your mind. This is how Jesus handled the law, not with punishment, but with gracious forgiveness. This new covenant God sent in Jesus, the Son, was something altogether from the, different from the Pharisees' desire to be controlled by the law to their perfection. The covenant in Christ Jesus was also different from the temple worship, which Jesus preached were simply empty emotions and held no meaning whatsoever to God. In a sense, the temple was big business with the priestly class managed and profited from at the expense of real faith in the Lord God. This new covenant between Jesus the Christ and the Lord God and the people or the sinners would be completely different from the accepted norms of the Pharisees and the priest. The law would revert back to its core teachings, the Ten Commandments, and there would no longer be a need for temple worship nor for sacrifice. Worship of God would be made personal through prayer through faithful living, and through learning more and more about faith. These behaviors would please God. The punitive 
and the regulatory aspect of the law would be lifted away with Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem and the recognition of his identity by the people, the finally, final godly covenant with the people had arrived. We, you and I, every person who professes Christ as Lord and Savior, remain in the same personal and final covenant established by the Lord through God's Son, Jesus, as a new relationship built on forgiveness, grace, and mercy, and most importantly, built upon love. We are free to accept or to reject this covenant. It is a choice on our part. If we accept living in a life where we repent and God is forgiving, we are then called to share this amazing truth with other people. This new and final covenant is not exclusive but instead is wide and inclusive, welcoming every person who recognize we are all sinners, each of us constantly in need of the Lord's loving mercy. The crowning act and moment in Jesus establishing this new personal covenant would come in just a few short days after the shouts and the palm waving had all faded away. Jesus faced the cross, a sacrifice not for his sake, but for our sakes. The last and final sacrifice given or ever needed. Let us pray. O Lord of all mystery, truth, and knowledge, we recognize how quickly a triumphal entry ends in grief, sadness, and confusion. Jesus made it all the way up the steep climb from humble Bethany and Bethpage to the mighty city gates of Jerusalem. The people cheered him on. They celebrated his victory. They wanted him to go further, all the way to the temple, the king's palace, and the governor's mansion, and unseat and usurp the whole miserable lot. But you had other plans for your son. His role was to remain humble, to serve, and to suffer, even death, in order to bring forgiveness and mercy, justice and righteousness to all who sin and could recognize their weakness and shortcomings. As we make our way through a second Holy Week, confined and constricted by the continuing COVID-19 pandemic, may we each humble ourselves and seek your grace for all our arrogance and selfishness. As we do so, most loving Lord God, we lift in prayer those who have the greatest needs during the pandemic, those whose life on earth is slipping away, those who struggle with chronic disease and other illness, those who mourn and grieve for all who have perished during this challenging year, and all who continue their battles to regain health and well-being. This morning we pray for Eleanor Allman and her family. Bring her comfort and peace as she endures her last days on earth prior to embracing the joy of your eternity. Continue to bring healing and strength to Doris Huntley in her recovery from surgery. And be also with our members, friends, and family whom we name now, including Colleen Erickson, Roy Jopes, Bud Dick, Elaine Kester, Nancy Clark, Hillary Bride, Jane Friday, Brian Armitrout, Phil Cooper, Cindy Martin, and Chris Walter's mother. We pray for each, asking, O oh, healing God, that you may touch their lives and bodies and bring to each their needed healing and comfort. 
We continue our prayers, O Lord, of peace for those whose lives have, were taken and the family and friends and communities who grieve the loss of life to violent, senseless acts of cowardice and prejudice in Georgia, Colorado, and throughout our nation. Turn the minds and hearts of all who plan and might commit such deeds in the future towards your loving nature and stop them. We ask for your peace and calm to settle upon us each as we prepare this week to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, Christ Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. into the world in peace. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit this day and throughout this Holy Week as we lead the way to resurrection morning. Amen. <laughs>